morning. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. This message is, uh, I can't tell you how important it is. It's called Successful Living. I did youth camps for 25 years all over this country, and at every youth camp I always gave this message. So whether you're a teenager, whether you're married, a young married, a single, whatever, I just think this message is one of the most important messages that you could ever hear. Some years back, I saw a young girl. She was about 16 years old, a young black girl. And she had a t-shirt on that simply said, God didn't make no junk. You agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely, I agree with that. I believe the fingerprints of God are upon every single person in this building. I don't care if you're a seventh grader and think you're a dork. The fingerprints of God are upon you. And God has something special for your life. I believe God designed every life in this auditorium to fulfill a significant purpose. So I want to challenge you to live in such a way that when you break the tape at the end of your life, you did it right. Your relationship with God is right. Your relationship with your family is right. Your relationship with your world is right in that your life made a difference in this world. Well, let me begin by telling you how that worked out in my life because successful living did not come very easy for me. Um, in one of his movies, comedian Rodney Dangerfield was speaking to a graduating class in this movie. And he looked over the class and he said, so, you're going out into the world. Here's my advice to you. Don't go. <laughs> it's rough out there. Move back in with your parents and let them worry about it. Well, that was never more true of anyone than Jerry Thorpe when I graduated magna cum lucky from Odessa High School a long time ago. I didn't have anything together in my life. I wasn't so eaten up with bad stuff. It was just no stuff at all. I wasn't involved in anything, ran with the wrong crowd. My social life, I was kind of a classic blind date. I didn't have anything together in my life. Let me explain it to you this way. In my high school, it was people like me who made the top half of the class possible. <laughs> you understand what I mean by that? And when I graduated from high school in our Odessa High School Annual, they put your picture, they put your name, they put everything you did in three years of high school, and we all wrote our ambitions. In my high school annual, there's my picture and my name, everybody got that, and there's not a single thing I did in the three years of our structure of high school that they could even put in the annual. I'm not on clubs, athletics, drama, sport, nothing. I did nothing in three years of high school. And my ambition, written in my 1954 Odessa High School annual is to have an ambition. <laughs> I am 18 years old, graduating from high school. My ambition was to have an ambition. But when I graduated from college, I was on the, I was the honor student in history. I was on the dean's list. And as the preacher said, for 36 years, I pastored what became the largest church in Odessa, Texas. So I think you would have a right to say, well, whoa, what changed? And the answer is, I changed. And the catalyst of that change, the thing that brought it all about and kicked it off, was a salvation experience with Jesus Christ when I was a freshman in college, where I accepted Jesus Christ as being God and my Savior. That was not a decision my parents made. I didn't just go through some religious motions. I had already done all that stuff because I kind of grew up in the church. So when I was a little guy, I went up and joined the church, got baptized, did all that stuff. And I'd been around it enough that I knew all the game and how it was played. I knew when to stand up, when to sit down, knew all the words to all the songs. But Jesus Christ was not a reality to me. I was playing games with God. Um... Uh, I was just lost. I needed God. I, I, I needed God to change me. I believed that God loved me. I believed that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross for me. But I never really truly, from my soul and heart, acted upon that. But in a service just like this, guys, at the close of the service, I stepped out from where I was sitting and walked to the front. And like you've got a place of prayer, I just knelt and prayed the simplest prayer from the heart of my everything that I was. 
And I told God, listen, I know I've messed up. I know I'm a sinner. I'm like a prodigal son coming home. I know you love me. I don't know why. I don't know how, but you do. And I know Jesus died for me. And I know you've got a purpose and a plan for my life. And I right now ask you to forgive my sins and come into my heart and change my life. And that night, my life was totally changed. So before I talk to you about some principles of successful living, may I tell you that if Jesus Christ and you are not together, and you don't know beyond any doubt if you died today, you'd go to heaven, and you know that Jesus Christ is a reality to you, let's start there. Because let me ask you a question. What on earth could you accomplish in life that would mean anything at all if as soon as you die, you spend an eternity apart from God? Jesus Christ asked that question in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. He said, for what shall it profit? It'll be on your screen, I think. For what shall it profit a man if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Jesus said, what could you possibly accomplish in life that would be worth anything if you died and spent an eternity separated from God? Dwight David Eisenhower was born in Kansas, Abilene, Kansas. You've just named your new airport after him. He had an incredible career. He was a five-star general. He was a supreme commander over United States forces in the Normandy Beach D-Day, the most important day of World War II. He is also the 34th president of these United States. But in 1969, he was a patient in Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, and he asked for Dr. Billy Graham to come. And Billy Graham said, when I walked in the room, the president had his normal big smile, but he knew he didn't have long to live. And he said to me, Billy, I want you to tell me once again how I can be sure my sins are forgiven and that I'm going to heaven when I die because nothing else matters now. Nothing else matters now that you know beyond any doubt that Jesus Christ is a reality to you. So I accepted the Lord. And three months, I, I was saved the first Sunday night of January. And three months later in March, I felt God was calling me to be a preacher. And that astounded me because I knew if I was God, I wouldn't have called a dork like me to be a preacher. But the command and the call of God was sure. So I surrendered my life in the church where I was saved and baptized. And you know something? Even then, my life had not been successful to that point, but I really wanted to be successful. So I began reading biographies of great men and women and what changed their life in the military world, in the political world, in the entertainment world, in the sports world, and of course in the Bible. I, I read with amazement the great people in the Bible and, and what made them distinct. And, and I, I'm just going to bring them down to one. Of all the great people I read, I'm going to take a few moments this morning and build my message around the words of the Apostle Paul. I consider the Apostle Paul perhaps the greatest single human, you know, greatest single Christian that humanity has ever produced. If you hold in your, bi in your lap a Bible, the Apostle Paul wrote at least 13 books of the New Testament of your Bible. He lived his life like a suicidal maniac for Jesus Christ. And when he came to the close of his life, he's in Rome, he's in prison, he's about to die, he knows he's about to die. Tradition tells us Nero had him executed, the, the Roman emperor, and he was writing 2 Timothy, and he said the most incredible thing. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I, I pictured a man running a race. You break the tape at the end of your life. Paul said, I have finished my course. I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. Now think about that a minute. What would it be like if you live your life and come to the very last moments of your life and you could honestly look God in, in the eye and say, God, I'm right where you wanted me to be when I die. I have finished the course. You saved me on the Damascus Road. You gave me a race to run. And in the last moments of my life, I'm exactly where you wanted me to be. I finished my course. That blew me absolutely away and became the basis of this message. Because I began looking in the writings of Paul, did you ever just sum up what you think are the ingredients of successful living? 
And I think I found them in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Paul said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but, here's the first point, this one thing I do. Second point, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching for those things that are ahead. Second point. Third point, I press. I will never quit. I've got things in my life that are, uh, that are so important to me, I will never give up on them. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Three simple points. This one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, I will never quit. Let's talk about them. Now you can call this a dream, you can call it vision, you can call it ambition, you can call it a goal. That's what I've always called it, is just being goal-oriented. Whatever you call it, there is no success without it. There is no success in your life until you can honestly say, this one thing I do. Now when I was a young guy in the ministry pastoring there in Odessa, the church sent me to Fort Worth, Texas, to the Tarrant County Convention Center where I joined seven, 8,000 other people and for seven or eight hours listened to five of the greatest motivational speakers in America. This was a positive mental attitude rally. It was a secular rally. I heard Paul Harvey, Zig Ziglar, Norman Vincent Peale, Cavett Robert, and W. Clement Stone. They ate me up about my character, about my attitude, about creativity, about motivation, about organization, about the importance of surrounding myself with good people. And they talked to me about hard work, but all five of them talked to me about my goals. They said 80% of the people in America have never set their goals. They said 15% of the people in America have some idea of what their life's about, but only 5% of the people in America have ever sat down and set their goals. But they said those 5% who have written out their goals are more successful than the other 95% put together. And why would you doubt that? Let me ask you three questions. They'll be on your screen. First of all, how can you hit a target that you cannot see? At this uh, seminar, Zig Ziglar, who's a great motivational speaker and a great Christian, talked about the archer, Howard Hill. He said Howard Hill was such a great archer that he could take the first arrow and split the bull's eye, and he could take the second arrow and split the first arrow. Then he looked out and said, but I could teach you to beat him easily in a few minutes. Well, I was pretty skeptical about that because I've never even shot bow and arrows. He said it'd be easy. I don't care how much talent Howard Hill has, let me blindfold him and let me spin him around a couple of times. And I don't care how much talent he has, you're going to come closer, even though you've never shot a bow and arrow at all, you're going to come closer to hitting the target than Howard Hill will because you can see what your goal is. How can you hit a target that you cannot see? Second, how can you arrive at a destination if you don't know where you're going? And the third little statement is what I had been living by to that point. If you aim at nothing, you can hit it every single time. If you aim at nothing, you'll get there. So I went home from this seminar and I took an eight and a half by 14 rule sheet of paper and I wrote at the top, Christian. And I set my goals for the next year as a Christian. Wrote them down. Here's my goals about the Bible. Here's my goals about prayer. Here's my goals about witnessing. Here's a goal about my personal relationship with God. As a Christian, here are my goals. Second page, I wrote family. And I wrote my goals as a husband and as a father. And things I could do to be a better husband and things I could do. I'm not talking about abstract things. Things I can do in my marriage to be better. I wrote my goals. Third, I said in the job I was doing at church, I started out as youth director and then later became pastor and I wrote my goals for what I was doing in the church and fourth then I just wrote my dreams my bucket stuff about life if you ask me a secular reason why the church in Odessa as a preacher said got to be by far the largest church in the city and when I left there in 2000 when I retired after 36 years as pastor there we were on four full city blocks of downtown Odessa, built over a great portion of that. 
and everything was paid for and we had money in the bank. And I had 12 full-time staff guys, ministers, staff ministers that worked with me. And if you want to know a secular reason, it's because every year when we came to the close of this year, like in October, all of my guys and ladies that worked on our full-time ministerial staff set their goals in this order. I want your goals as a Christian. I want your goals in your family. I want your goals in your department. If you're the if you're a high school director, junior high director, if you're music director, the ladies administrator, whatever your goals are, whatever your position is, I want your goals. First of all, as a Christian, second, in your family, third, in your responsibility, and fourth, what are your dreams for the church? And I kept those, and every year during the year when we met together, we took those goals out and went over. And every year when we started, our church knew what we were trying to do during this year. Here's what we want to do with buildings. Here's what we want to do financially. Here's what we want to do in reaching people. When we started every year, for, for, after I went to this seminar, every year we began, these were our goals. And that's the reason it worked. Because I knew, staff knew, church knew, this one thing I do. And I'm going to tell you guys something. Until you sit down and say, this is what my life is about, you'll never get anywhere. And most people don't set goals. We have wishes. I, can, I say to people, uh, what's your goal? Uh, preacher, I need to lose a little weight. Okay, that sounds nice, but that's not a goal. That's a wish. A goal says, over the next year, my goal is to lose 36 pounds. And how I'm going to do it, I'm going to lose 3 pounds every month. My goal is to lose 3 pounds January, 3 pounds February, and at the close of the year, I will have lost 36 pounds. That is a goal. It's identifiable. See, I need to lose a little weight. It's not identifiable. I mean, you can lose 1 pound and you've got your goal. That's nothing. It's identifiable. It's measurable. It's challenging. Losing 36 pounds in a year is challenging. And fourth, it's public because you told me about it. That's the four ingredients of your goals. They must be identifiable. I, t I talk to men and I say, uh, what are your goals as a husband? Or oh, preacher, I can answer that. Okay, fine, answer it. What are your goals as a husband? Well, I tell you. Well, I say, let me ask you a question. Tell me five things as a husband that are your goals. He said, I'll tell you. First of all, if my wife would do this, and then this, and if my wife would do this, and then this, then my marriage would be better. And I said, whoa, I didn't ask you five things your wife could do. Tell me five things you can do in your marriage to make it better than it's ever been. I ask you men, why don't you sit down and say, here are five things as the husband of this family. Do you ever have date nights with your wife? Do you help her around the house? Do you keep your big mouth shut when you need to keep your big mouth shut? Amen. <laughs> Got some amens on that, all right. I mean, write five things you could do that make your marriage better than it's ever been. Not five things she could do, five things you could do. Tell me five ways you could be a better father to your children. Tell me five ways you could be a better mother to your children. Tell me five ways you could be a better wife to your husband. To you, you, you teenagers, tell me five things you could do in your home that would make your home just really a special place for you. Let me, tell, let me ask you teens a few other questions. You guys ever set your goals? Tell me five things you'd like to be true about the place you go to college. Tell me five things if you're in high school or junior high. Tell me five things that are your goals for your school year. You're fixing to start again. Why don't you sit down and write five things as your goal? You got any goals about your grades? You got any goals about the things you're going to get involved in in school? Got any goals about living a life in such a way that others will see Jesus Christ in you? You see, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Let me ask you teens another deal. Tell me five things you'd like to be true about the person you marry. You want them to have a faith in Jesus Christ like you have a faith in Jesus Christ? Do you want them to honor their mom and dad? Because if they don't honor their mom and dad, they won't honor your mom and dad. Do you want somebody that, that uh, studies and makes good grades? Because if they don't make good grades and they haven't got any brains, they're not going to amount to a whole lot. You, you, is it your goal that they're a hard worker? Uh, is it your goal that they're moral and clean? Because if you don't get a moral husband, moral wife, how are your kids going to be moral? 
See, if you don't set for goals like that of what you want in your life, then you're gonna end up living in the mobile home next to your mother when you get married. <laughs> so the difference in life is that we back up and say, this one thing I do. I would challenge every single person in this building, you go home today and you get a pad of paper and you just be honest and write your goals as a Christian. Why don't you set it as a goal, I'm gonna read my Bible through every year. Why don't you set your goals about prayer? I'm going to make a list of people that I need to pray for, and I'm going to pray through that list every day. Why don't you make some challenges in your life about how you're going to share your faith with others and set a goal to witness to one or two people and just let them know Jesus Christ is a reality and that he's changed your life. Why don't you set in your life goals and set financial goals? And a great financial goal is to get God involved in your finances from the very beginning. How on earth can you be a financial success if the God who made this whole universe is not a part of your financial life? And make the church's finances a part of your goal. It's important to me our church be strong and well. And the only way the church can be financially strong is if I do my part as a member of the church by supporting the church with my tithes and offerings as God asked me to do. And folks, if we don't do that, Five years from now, when you wheel me in on a walker or something, and I stand up here trembling to preach, you'll be the same person you are right now. You'll be the same person in five years you are right now, with the single exception of this one thing I do. Got to set goals. And Paul said it, this one thing I do. Second, he said, forget those things that are behind. Now, let me tell you why this point is really important. Because too many times, teens and adults and all of us, our present and our future get crippled by mistakes we've made in the past. And, and we think about doing something big and we think, oh man, I messed up on that. And so we back up. Well, the person who wrote this, who said forgetting those things that are behind are the Apostle Paul, who, who was a militant Jewish terrorist against Jesus Christ when he was saved. He was on his way to Damascus to kill Christians and Jesus Christ personally stopped him on the way and changed his life and called him to be a preacher and set his goals. I, Paul, I want you to witness to the kings of the earth and to the Gentiles and, and to the Jews. And Paul must have said, whoa, God, whoa, time out. God, you, you, God, you know what I've been? I've been a, I, I have killed Christians. I've tore up the church. I was on my way to Damascus to wreck the church. God, do you know what I've been? Do you know what I've done? And, and God would have said, Paul, I'm God. Of course. I know what you've been. Now here's what I want you to be. And I know what you've done. But here's what I want you to do. So Paul learned that God uses people who have made mistakes. You say, Jerry, you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. Your future is clean. The slate is clean. Put the past under the blood of Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive you. And from this point on, it's a brand new slate. And that's what Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind. So Paul said, for me to be successful, I had to forget some things. And so did I. And I still have to. And so do you. And I want to name two. First of all, forget your inadequacies. We're all inadequate. We're all inadequate. I talk to people and I say, what are your dreams? What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And I had a young lady said, you know, Jerry, I, I was in college and I love college. And then I met Bill and we fell in love when we got married. And then I got pregnant and I had to drop out of school. But I've always dreamed of finishing college. And I said, well, why don't you, why don't you finish college? Why don't you do it? And then she'll stop telling me all the ways inadequate. Well, Jerry, I don't have one kid now. I got three and got a job. And we got, you know, I just, I just don't think, I just don't think, you know. What are your dreams? What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? You know, Jerry, I've been working at this company for 10 years. I think I'm smart. I think I could do a good job. I think I could be a successful person in business for myself. That's my dream. Why don't you do it? I don't know, it's scary. You know, what if I got into it and I failed? I got a wife, I got kids. What if I, I messed up? And you know, I've done some things in the past and we start dumping all the way that we couldn't do it. Forget your inadequacies. Let me tell you about one of my heroes. 
When our church was, I mean, we were really growing and I'm preaching. I got, we got to have help in the Sunday school. We got all these kids coming in and we need people to love them and teach them. And she walked up. She is a new member of the church. Her name was Joe Crouch. I barely knew her name because she had just come into the church. And she said, I would like to, I'd like to, to, to teach. I said, okay, your name's Joe, isn't it? Right? Run that by me again. She said, well, 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 you, you said you needed to teach. I, I, I would like to teach. She's right. I said we needed teachers. And here's a woman of God who said, I, I would like. But boy, did she stutter. Well, what do you do? Gave her a class in the four-year-olds. She later became superintendent of the department. Every time we had a workers meeting and she gave a report, it was like, we, we had 75 and we have to 12 teachers. And every time we had a testimony meeting on Wednesday night and she stood up, it was like, I, 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 I'm so glad the Lord saved me. She could have said all of the rest of her life in the auditorium class listening to me teach Sunday school. But God said, I want you to do bigger things. So she walked up. How much courage does it take to walk up to the preacher and say, ah, I, 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 I like that. And how much courage does it take to walk down that hall and sit down with those little boys and girls? And you don't even know if they can understand you. Well, however much courage it takes, Joe had it. She walked down that aisle and walked down that hall and sat down with those kids and made an amazing discovery. When she talked to me, she stuttered. When she talked to adults, she stuttered. When she talked to those kids, she spoke like an angel. She could have spent all of her life sitting right where you're sitting saying, I, I would like to, to teach, but, but I can't because I stutter. But one day she forgot it. And that made all the difference in the world. God love her. She's a great lady. God love her. I mean, you sit out there and say, yeah, okay, Jerry, it's easy for you to say stuff like that. I mean, you get up there and preacher gets up there and it rolls out of you. I bet you guys never make a mistake. And you know, whoa, what? Amen. What? <laughs> I remember I was doing a youth camp down in Florida one night. And uh, yeah, I mean, one week, years and years ago, and I'm sitting right here, I'm fixing to speak, and the guy who was speaking, I really didn't, hardly knew it. I really didn't know much of anybody there. And uh, it was high school kids, probably 300 of them down in Florida. And this guy got up to introduce me, but before he introduced me, he said, I know this first night of the camp, and I know all you kids are here, and you boys and girls, and, and I've noticed how you're watching each other. And what, he was right. Hormones rage first night of the camp. And the boys are eyeing the girls, and the girls are eyeing the boys, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he said, I just want to make a statement, what I believe. I believe anybody kisses a girl before he marries her is a sinner. I believe anybody kiss a girl before he marries her is a dirty, rotten sinner. And he said, I want to say something else. I never kissed my wife before I married her. And he whirled around and said, did you, Reverend Thorpe? And I said, well, hey, man, I never kissed your wife at all, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I just got here, you know. I've done things an idiot on a bad day wouldn't do. But you know what? Somewhere in life you forget those things, you forget your inadequacies, and you go on. So I beg you not to say, well, I've failed at this before, or I've messed up, or I, I'm not, I, you know, I'm, I'm th I don't know how much charisma I got or my education. You, you quit thinking you're inadequate. And just step up and do it. And the second thing I want to challenge you to forget is the skeptics in your life. We've all got skeptics. You, I, I mean, you're going to be hurt by people. Some of you, I hope not, but probably were raised by parents who told you ever since you was a little kid, you're not this, you're not that, you're not pretty, you're not smart, you're not athletic. You're not, and, and, and you bought in on that? You bought in on that? Really? No, come on. Or maybe when you were in school, kids can be cruel and, and kids picked on you and made fun of you and made little nicknames for you and things. And, and you let that cripple your life? No, no, no. Oh, we can get hurt. I, I mean, even in church, sometimes you can kind of let your guard down and say, you know what I've always wanted to do for God? I wanted to do this and this and this. And maybe somebody looked at you and said, oh, you could never do that. What? I love the story of the Apostle Peter walking on the water. 
The story is Jesus went up on the mountain to pray and sent his disciples across the little Sea of Galilee and there came a great storm and man, they, the Bible said they'd been nine hours toiling in rowing. They were exhausted. They were soaking wet. They're about half afraid. They're all going to die when all in the midst of this, they saw Jesus walking on the waves. And the apostle Peter saw him. God love him. Wouldn't you like to have a whole church full of apostle Peter said, Lord, I want to come to you. I want to walk on the water. And Jesus said, just like he says to every single one of you, to get out of your rut, get out of the place your life is, come on, come on. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water. And you say that in the average church and people say, yeah. What do you mean, yeah? Last time you went to the lake, somebody walked across. What, you see that all the time? <laughs> you went fishing on the river, somebody walked across the river. What, you see that all the time, do you? No, that's a very significant, you know, that's what all of us want to do with our life is to do something significant. But there's three things you got to do to walk on the water. Number one, you got to get out of the boat. You can't walk on the water in the boat. The boat's not a safe place to be. I mean, the boat, the, the boat is a pretty safe place to be. It's a lot more dangerous out there. It's not comfortable on the boat, but it's safer on the boat. That's where most everybody is, is on the boat. So most of us spend most of our life in the boat looking at that significant thing we want to do and saying, boy, you watch me. One of these days I'm going to walk on the water. No, you're not going to walk on the water till you get out of the boat. You can't walk on the water in the boat. What is it you want to do with your life that's significant and real and positive and you feel like God's in it? You can't do it in the boat. Second, you've got to forget the storm. Uh, Peter starts to get out of that boat and it was woo, and I bet he said, whoa, Lord, wait a minute. If you could calm it down a little bit, I think I could do it. No, nope. If you're going to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat in the storm. I pastored 36 years. You know something, guys? We never set out to do anything significant. We didn't build all over those blocks. I mean, that's a building at a time and add on and do it and borrow money and do it. And I never led the church to do a single thing that people didn't tell me, you've done it now. Oh, really? What have I done? Well, you've led the church into borrowing this money and building this building and, and we're, we're in a storm. I said, what kind of a storm are we in? Well, we're in an economic storm. Price of oil is going to go down and things like that. You know something? We'd have never done anything, never done anything significant at the Temple Baptist Church in Odessa, Texas, if we'd have stayed in the, board, the boat and said, I'm afraid of the storm. We had to get out of the boat in the storm. You've got to get out of the boat. You've got to forget the storm. Third, you've got to ignore the boat people. <laughs> you see, boat people never walk on water. Their goal is to keep you from walking on water. Did you ever think about that? you think they let Peter out of that boat easy? They did not. He started to get out and they said, whoa, 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 Peter, what are you doing? Well, I'm going to walk on the water. Jesus said to come out. Jesus said I could do it. I'm going to do it. Whoa, 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 no. Peter, you can't walk on the water. If you get out of the boat, you're going to drown. And if you drown, you're going to embarrass our church, our little church, if you drown. There ain't no rocks out there. I know you've heard the story. There ain't no rocks out there. If you get out of this boat, you're going to drown. And Thomas said, I doubt that's Jesus anyway. I don't th <laughs> Doubting Thomas, there's one of them every crowd. So before he walks on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. You've got to forget the storm. You've got to ignore the boat people. There are people in your life that will always say, you can't do it. You can't do it. So you've got to ignore them. But Peter did those three things and walked on the water. Paul said, this one thing I do, I've got goals in my life. I'm going to forget the things that I've messed up with the past, and I'm going forward. Let me give you one last brief point. The last part was simply, I press. Uh, probably to understand this point fully, you got to read the life of Paul, the shipwrecks, the stonings, the beatings, the, I mean, I told you at the beginning, I don't know, may have gone right through your head, that he lived his life like a suicidal maniac for Jesus Christ. He did. But he said, I'm never going to quit. Now, teens, listen to me. And adults, in your marriage is young marriage. Marriage is not easy. You get in your marriage, it's tough. What's the easy thing to do? Quit. Go home to mama. 
split. Grass is greener on the other side of the fence. But I've lived long enough to understand that winners are not people who never lose. Winners are people who never quit. Everybody loses. People that are winners in life are people who take their defeats, slam them to the ground, step on them, and rise above them. Paul simply said, I've got some things in my life that are bigger than me. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. And he just said, I will never quit. I've got things in my life too important to take for granted. Now I want to ask you a question. What do you got in your life you'd die for? Let's ask you men. Got anything in your life you'd die for that's more important than life to you? Hmm? That's what Paul said. I, I've got things that are so important in my life, I will never let them go. I want to close with this story. Years ago, I read it, and it just, I thought it was the greatest story I'd ever heard in my life, and I still do. This young man graduated from college and went to work for the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which built the series of dams across the southern United States that really changed the economic picture of the South in those days. And he went to work, and this first day he was on the job. They were building. The dam was coming up, and it collected a little water, but not very much. And, and the guy was showing him around, and he was standing at the top of where the dam was, and he was looking out over that broad expanse where the lake would be, and he saw a house out there in where the bottom of the lake was going to be. A house. It was obviously a very old house. It was a log house. It was obviously occupied because a plume of smoke was coming out of the chimney. And he asked the guy, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's that house doing there? He said, there's a really stubborn, bullheaded old man that lives in that house and he won't move. He said, you're kidding. I mean, that's where the bottom of the lake's going to be. I know, but that old man is so stubborn and so bullheaded he won't move. He said, who's talked to him? He said, everybody's talked to him. The government people, the engineers, the PR people, everybody's talked to him. He's just stubborn and bullheaded. Well, this young man had always loved his parents, loved his grandparents, and when they got through walking around, show, he, he just decided he wanted to meet that old man, so he walked all the way out there and knocked on the door. And he heard the shuffling of feet, and the door opened, and he was a very old man. He had a long white hair, long white beard, had little glasses on the end of his nose. And they stood at the door and talked for a little while, and they liked each other, so the old man invited the boy in. And they sat on two cane-bottomed chairs in front of the fireplace and talked. And after they'd talked a long time, the young man turned to the older gentleman, and he said, uh, Sir, look, I mean, I'm just out of college. I don't know a whole lot. Uh, and uh, you've got a nice house here, but you know this is where the bottom of the lake's going to be, and it's going to be here. You've got a nice house, but the government builds you a brand new house, and you've got nice property, but the government would give you brand new property, and you know this is where the bottom of the lake is going to be. He, he said, I don't understand, sir, why you won't move. And he said, the old man looked at him and he said, son, do you see that fire in the fireplace there? Do you see that fire? He said, my great granddaddy built that fire and it's never gone out. My great granddaddy kept that fire burning every day of his life. And then my grandfather kept that fire burning every day of his life. And my daddy kept that fire burning every day of his life. And I'm an old man, but that fire has burned every day of my life. And I will not move and put out that fire. I will not move. So you know what they did? The government came in and jacked that old house up and moved it with the fire still burning. Because somebody said, I got some fires in my life that are more important than anything else and I will not let the fire go out. You got fires like that in your life? When I was 19 years old, as I told you, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and that's a fire in my life I'm not going to let go out. That fire's more important than life. And 57 plus years ago, I married a girl named Freddie that I love with all my heart and soul. I'd rather die 
than let something happen that would hurt our marriage and our children. And I love the local church. That's a fire in my life. I, I gave my life in service of a local church. That's a fire I'm not going to let go out. I'm just asking you, you got any stuff in your life that's bigger than you? It's more important than just you. Your Savior, your church, your wife, your kids. Got any fires? Your morality, your character. Got any fires? Paul said, this one thing I do. This is what my life's about. Forgetting those things that are behind. I'm not going to let the past mistakes cripple present and future. And third, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now let's bow our heads for a moment. While our heads are bowed, and probably we will just sing a verse or so of invitation if you music people want to get ready. Because I think sometimes in a message we need to act on it. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't know if you died today you'd go to heaven. <coughs> Would you let me pray for you? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come talk to you. Somebody prayed for me. Somebody loved me. Somebody made a difference in my life. Would you let me pray for you? If you're here this morning, and you obviously are here this morning, and you just say, Jerry, pray for me. If I died today, I don't really know I'd go to heaven. I don't really have peace with God, what you were talking about. But I know I need to settle that. And I just want you to pray for me and I'll have courage to do it. Here again, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come talk to you. I'd just like to pray for you. Would you let me pray for you? How many over the building? Just raise your hand and just say, Preacher, pray for me by an upraised hand. Anyone like that? Just raise your hand high. Thank you. God.